my pleasure to welcome you here this, this afternoon. We'll have a number of welcomes, but I'm John Keithley, the Master of Ceremonies for this afternoon. This is the third of our Vasquez Lore Distinguished Lecture Series in Accounting, and we've been extremely fortunate to have top-notch speakers, and this year is no exception. Uh, let me first begin by introducing Dean Ellen Parshman. She is also the Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs. Have you picked up any other titles since I talked? Oh, okay. No, none that we get talked about. I see. All right. Okay. Uh, and she's here to, to welcome us uh, on behalf of the school and the university. Ella, thank you. So thank you, Dr. Keithley. I've been kind of out of the building most of the semester, and so I've been missing you. Uh, so this was my chance to come back and and, and be here for just a little while. And so uh, I'll just add my welcome to uh, Dr. Keithley's. So for those of you who are visiting uh, on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students, uh, a, a warm welcome to the John Cook School of Business. And very a special welcome to you for coming here and being part of St. Louis University now. And I know you've been enjoying our students and our faculty all day, so I'm, re I'm really glad you were able to have that experience. One important component of the vision statement for the school is to make an impact on our region. And it's through events like this uh, that we're able to bring together students and faculty and members of the, uh, of the accounting profession. We respond to that vision. The partnerships that are represented today uh, in our program help advance the school, and in particular, our accounting professions. So we're so grateful for the participation and support of everyone who's here in whatever your roles are uh, in, in those endeavors. So we're here today to learn about issues that are relevant to the very dynamic accounting profession and to the practice of the profession in the global business environment. And I know we're all looking forward to that, to gaining some insights uh, into that important topic. But as important as those issues are, it's even more significant that this event honors the contributions of two men, Charles Willard and Stephen Gasquez, who were instrumental in laying the foundation for this wonderful school that we have today. And many of you here knew them personally, uh, and so you, you, I, know, I know that, uh, that you feel the way I do about that. Dean Gasquez led the school during a critical time in its evolution, and Dr. Willard, through his role as accounting professor and chair of the department, shaped the experiences of accounting students, many of whom are now prominent members of the profession. Both men were loved and respected, and it's a fitting tribute to recognize them through this program. The efforts and support of many individuals are responsible for today's event, and you'll hear more about those uh, in a few minutes. However, I want to be sure to express my appreciation and gratitude to our sponsors and friends, and everyone who helped bring this program to fruition. And most importantly, Dr. John Keithley, who's been this champion since the very idea of it. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anand Sikharaman, who chairs our current programs here at the <coughs> University to continue our programs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very uh, pleased and delighted to see you all here, and particularly delighted to have Barry uh, speak to us today. Uh, events like this wouldn't be possible without the generous support of our friends and benefactors. And so I'd, I'd take a few minutes, if I could, to uh, recognize some of you. And if you're in, in the room, I'd ask that you stand up and so that you can be recognized. Um, there are some individuals and firms that uh, um, have sponsored this event. Uh, Mr. Brian Kinman, uh, Ms. Mary Jane Kinman, uh, Mr. Mark Wooler, uh, Mrs. Mary Wooler, Anders, and I just said that representative from Anders, um, Ernst and Young, uh, KPMG, and uh, Ruben Brown. So thank you very much. I will turn it back, uh, turn it over to uh, um, John Keatley. It's my 
pleasure to introduce a gentleman who had a great deal to do with this program this year, Jim Castellano. Jim is the chairman of the board of Ruben Brown LLP uh, and is also chairman of Baker Tilly International, which is the world's eighth largest network of independent accounting firms. Jim was instrumental in making initial contacts with Barry, twisting his arm, whatever he did, to get him to come. So it was, it was really very, very helpful, and we appreciate it very much. Jim is a, is a highly recognized and hardworking part of what it means to be an accounting professional. Jim was chairman of the American Institute of CPAs in 2002. Those of you who have been in my class know what we're talking about because he presented last Thursday night in my class. Think about what was going on in the accounting profession and in the, the U.S. economy in 2002. Names you probably remember like Enron, Worldcom, and a few others. Leading to Sarbanes-Oxley, Jim testified before both House and Senate committees during that period of time uh, and played a true leadership role. And in his discussion in my classes over the years, he's often mentioned his association with Barry during those days. Uh, he's been recognized many, many times. I would mention a couple of things. In 2012, the Journal of Accountancy listed Jim among the 125 people of impact on accounting. And if you look at that list of names, and there he is. That's quite an honor also received the AICPA's gold medal for distinguished service and done, has done many, many things in the community. He's chairman of the board of trustees at Rockhurst University. Uh, he's been chairman of Fon Bonn University Council here. He's on the board of directors at Cardinal Glenn, et cetera, et cetera. Many, too many activities to mention, but he's a true friend, and we thank you very much for his efforts this year. Jeff, he will hear you so speak. Thank you, John, and Dean Harshman, and Anant, uh, all faculty, students, and other sponsors here for being here this afternoon. I want to uh, congratulate John and Ellen and Anant for creating this event to honor the two great professors, Wooler and Baskin. It's a very uh, fitting way to honor the legacy that they've left here at St. Louis University. Uh, before I introduce Barry, I want to also introduce a couple of colleagues, Jim O'Halloran, who's the CEO of the Missouri Society of CPAs. Jim, stand there. Thank you. Peter Charmatero, a St. Louis University alum, who's the uh, president of the Missouri Society of CPAs. Jim and Peter uh, were quite gracious in hosting Barry and uh, doing some roundtables with some Missouri Society members today as well. So thank you for that. You know, as uh, John mentioned, the AICPA is 125 years old this year, and it's grown to be the largest professional organization in America. In 1995, at the very young age of 37, Barry Melanson uh, stepped into the role as CEO, President and CEO of the AICPA. He's now the longest serving CEO of the AICPA in history. Uh, in 2011, Barry was recognized as the Association Executive of the Year by Association Trends Publication. I've had a personal opportunity, as John mentioned, to work with Barry. Uh, some very exciting times, very difficult times. I've described him to people as a transformational leader. He's you know, led the profession through a number of very tumultuous times. Uh, steadfastly standing for the profession's responsibility to serve the public interest, but also uh, always looking ahead, creating and seizing opportunities to position the CPA, the United States CPA, as the leading global credential uh, in, in, in the world, leading global credential. Mm -hmm. So the list of things that he has spearheaded from the Center for Audit Quality, XBRL, private company financial reporting, uh, computerizing the CPA exam, financial literacy, the Pathways Commission to continue to improve accounting education, student recruitment, uh, leading the charge to create a new global credential, uh, the 
the uh, certified global management accountant credential, and positioning the CPA, as I said, as the leading global credential. Under his leadership, AICPA membership has reached new records, and more students are choosing accounting careers than at any other time in the history of the profession. So uh, you'll find Barry to be a person of remarkable vision and energy, which you are about to experience. So if you would, please join me in welcoming Barry to the stage. since we referenced Enron and WorldCom in, in that period of time in, in Jim's comments and, and Dr. Keithley, thank you for having me here and your comments. Uh, at the ASCPA, we have a chairman who serves a year. Uh, really, they end up serving three years. They have a chair-elect year, the chair, the past chair, and, John, and uh, Jim was during that incredible time of Enron and WorldCom and Anderson, and uh, one unlike any other time in our history. We have a saying at the ASCPA that uh, it's always the right person at the right time, the, the nominations process and the governance process. Uh, and in that period of time, sure proved that to be true because Jim and, and those of you who know Jim here in St. Louis and now globally with Baker Tilly, uh, it, it was just incredible. His sort of demeanor to the calmness that was necessary when hundreds of thousands of members were not too happy about a whole lot of things at the time. And the media and the Congress and everything going on. Was, uh, it was a, a tremendous learning experience, and so thank you for all that you've done for the profession. I should also recognize uh, Tom Hilton, uh, who's the chair of your accounting uh, advisory board here, uh, now in his third year doing that, and uh, another sort of influence point from Missouri and St. Louis, in, in addition to the introductions of Jim and Peter. Uh, Tom is on our board of directors today, uh, um, serving in, a, in the middle of a, of a three year term on our board has been very active in a lot of the activities of the Institute, including in some of the specialized areas uh, that we have. I really enjoyed today, where I spent some time in a couple of classrooms, uh, and some great questions. Some of you are in the audience, thank you for being here, and, and I hope to have a little bit of time for some Q&As from that standpoint as well. Um, it, it's, Dean, it's great for you to be here. I was enjoying the time last night, and I know you're wearing the two hats, so I know your schedule is very, very busy in, in, in being here. Dr. Nath, it was a pleasure to be with you. I have to brag about him a little bit because um, one of the things that is on our agenda, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our Pathways Commission, is just real strong practical research from the academic community that can be applied. And uh, he has been engaged in a couple projects, one particularly that I think is very practical and uh, is, is uh, useful in some of our regulatory debate as well. So thank you for your leadership from that standpoint. What I'm going to do today is pick up this piece of paper that I just knocked down on the floor, but um, really talk about some of the changes in the profession from the standpoint of uh, the macro implications um, and also where the profession is today. Some a little peering over to the not too distant future and then spend a little time wrapping up with some, some look at uh, some of the DC issues and some of the things that are going on uh, from that element. It's impossible to talk about accounting and financial reporting and the business community without talking about some of the major things that are affecting everything we do. And they're not surprising. You know all about technology, the demographics of society, globalization, just to name a few. Uh, and also, in, in looking at those, sort of connecting the dots to how they affect our profession. And, and we focus on people first. Because no matter what the technology is, and no matter um, you know, what the globalization trends are, really the economic dependency trends between countries, in the end, it's the people of our profession. And we believe, and we're biased, we admit, but from a CPA profession perspective, we believe that the makeup of the people who aspire to and are in our profession is very unique. It is unlike sort of a collective group of any other profession. The commitment to ethics, the commitment to doing the right things, the commitment to competencies and continuing competencies, uh, and really to making a difference in society and the business world is unlike any other. And we view ourselves as truly those trusted advisors to business at all shapes and sizes of business uh, in every corner today of the globe and certainly of this country. 
and that is a uniqueness in our profession. From that standpoint, uh, those macro trends are always looked at in that particular environment. So when we look at the profession today, I'm going to start with that human capital notion. And one of the messages I gave to the classrooms today is that it, it is hard to imagine a better time to be about to enter the profession of becoming a CPA. If you just look at the demographic realities of the profession, while we have record numbers, as Jim mentioned, in the profession today in the United States, the fact is, is that with our record numbers of people majoring in accounting and in the profession, we're still going to have to have approximately another decade of record numbers in order to replace CPAs one for one. We have this huge bubble of baby boomers racing to retirement, or like I like to say, at least during 2008, 2009, they hit the pause button on their race to retirement, but they hit the play button again. And within the next decade, this record number of people are going to retire. These lead firms, they are key players in financial management, and it's going to take a lot of effort to replace that talent and that commitment and that professionalism. And we add to that, our economy is evolving. And the expectation of what accountants do, what CPAs do in that particular environment is increasing. In fact, estimates are that over the next 10 years, without any consideration for changing the demographics, we will have about a 22% increase in the demand for accounting jobs. And so if you're a junior or a senior or maybe a master's student in accounting at, at St. Louis University, your prospects are very positive because you have people racing to retirement, you have greater demand, and we start from a position of being essentially the most recession-proof profession in the United States. When the United States um, unemployment rate was, let's say, give or take 10%, uh, the accountancy unemployment rate we estimated to be about 3.5%. For those of you who have taken econ courses or can remember far enough back to your own econ courses, you know that anything under 4% is generally considered full employment. And so we have, we have basically had full employment in our profession for a, 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 an extended period of time now. And so when you combine all of those factors, it's just this incredible opportunity as a student uh, to enter a profession that can propel you really wherever you want to go. And I think that that's really the number one message. And the great opportunity is that we're in a period of transformation as a the period of transformation, by that I mean what we do is evolving, the expectations are evolving, and the opportunity to create a new, in effect, a new profession, one that is 125 years old but is operating in today's environment, is in fact um, in, a, in a period of transformation, and it's just a great opportunity. So let me give you some examples. There are 44,000 CPA firms in the United States, which is a pretty staggering number when you think about that number. And the 500th largest has about 20 CPAs in it. So if you have 50 CPAs, you're probably in the top 200 from a size perspective. If you have 20, you're in the top 500. And in that environment, those firms on the smaller end of that spectrum essentially serve half of the United States economy. And that half is made up of businesses that we would call Main Street businesses, businesses that are entrepreneurial. There are some 26 million of those in the United States. If you include people who work at home and stuff as, as a business, and if you really look at storefront type businesses, it's about 7 million or so of those in the United States. And CPAs have an unbelievable relationship. And what is happening in that environment today is certain technological changes are changing the relationship with CPA firms. And it's being manifested by predominantly cloud computing. See, a CPA firm in the 80s, a large portion of a smaller CPA firm in the 80s was about sort of a relationship on a monthly or quarterly or maybe an annual basis with a, with a business in which you took business information and you sort of massaged it in a way that you produced a financial statement or you produced a tax return. And with the advent of the microcomputer in the, in the early 80s, it was the first sort of wave of technological transformation for our profession in which that relationship shifted very significantly. It was more cost effective for that small entrepreneurial business to no longer, in effect, outsource that work to a CPA firm, but rather to insource that work with the installation of their own microcomputers and servers and networks and installed software to do what it is that predominantly a CPA firm was doing. 
And so through that period of time, CPA firms evolved to be this trusted advisor, much more planning, much more strategic, much more uh, business-oriented advisory work, along with some element of accounting and tax that remained, but not the total amount that was previously being done. And that was the decade of the 80s and the 90s and into the first, first few years of the 2000s. And then cloud computing started to change that particular environment. And in that environment, all of a sudden, combined with a recession of 2008, 2009, the economics of the relationship with a CPA firm started to change. No longer did a small business need to install a microcomputer network or servers, et cetera, from an accounting perspective, but rather using cloud shared resources from a technological perspective the whole relationship of business process outsourcing became the new transformation of the relationship. And today, thousands of CPA firms are building businesses in that particular world, some quicker than others, some embracing change faster than others, but a transformation that is occurring. And so the small business relationship and the CPA firm relationship has changed. Now let's shift gears to the larger end of the business environment, the other half of the United States economy that essentially resides in public companies, listed companies, Fortune 500 and all the way down to the maybe 13,000 public companies in the United States. Collectively, they're about the other half of our economy in rough terms. And what is happening in that environment is that is traditionally more of an audit and tax relationship between the CPA firm and the business, and also the business as significant employers of CPAs and business and industry. And the transformation is a little bit slower here, but the transformation that is going to occur in that particular relationship is primarily driven by the concept of big data. So to give you an example of how big data might have an implication uh, to our profession and to business reporting, well, let's just sort of take a trip to Orlando and envision it being in Disney today. And if you were in Disney today as, let's say, a 10-year-old girl, you would get a bracelet from Disney. And as you meandered around the many parks in Orlando that are under the Disney brand, every place you'd go, there'd be sensors that would sort of identify, I'll call her Sally, as she moved around the park and she went on different rides and different experiences. And Disney will be co collecting in the concept of big data everything about Sally's visit over a couple of days. And as her visit migrates, and she goes into a ride, big data allows Disney to create a virtualization experience for her and says, Sally, as she's entering the ride, how was your day? Yeah, a virtual person or a virtual character saying, Sally, how was your visit yesterday to the water park? How was your experience visiting with Mickey when you went to Tomorrowland, et cetera, et cetera. Now forget the privacy and security issues of what I just described to you because they are real. But if we take that concept of the incredible ability of technology to monitor, to develop, to trend, to calculate everything that everybody and every business does and set that in the context of auditing a set of financial statements, you can see without too much imagination, you don't even need Disney's imagination, to see how we must change from an audit perspective. Because the real world will be with this accumulation of information, big data. We will be, a company will be issuing a financial statement. We will be providing an audit associated with that financial statement. And somewhere in a garage in Wyoming is somebody that's going to be doing data analytics in this huge warehouse of information. And they, because of their penetrating look through big data, maybe the access of something that they shouldn't be accessing, whatever the case may be, they may know more about a piece of that business than the auditor does or the CFO does. And therein lies some exposure, some risk from the financial reporting perspective. And so the challenge for us is how do we evolve an audit process to accomplish that or to, to create an environment in which we are really addressing the true accumulation of information and data that we might have. And so we can imagine, for instance, as we take, if you take an auditing class, you learn about sampling. We could imagine an environment in which an audit might not have sampling anymore. That through the use of big data, we can have 100% testing of transactions with exception reporting. And the speed in which we can achieve that 
might change the whole process of creating assurance over that information set. Now add to that the expectation of people of what they want from an information set. And what people really want today from an information set is a much broader picture than accounting standard setters. The two previous presenters, Dr. Keith Lee here, were both accounting standard setters, Bob Hers and Sir David Tweed, US GAAP, International, IFRS. And accounting standard setting, a very important and critical role to our transparent capital markets and increasingly the world's transparent capital markets, is really about sort of what we know about financial but what people want, users want, is more digestible information about that company to make whatever decision that they might be making. And there lies a broader reporting context. Now we would define that broader reporting context as something called the Inter International Integrated Reporting Framework, or the in set by the International Integrated Reporting Council. We actually at the AICPA began the journey down this process in 1995, which sounds like I know for some of you an awful long time ago. Some of us with gray hair maybe doesn't seem like too long ago. But we started that process with a report. It, it bared the name of um, uh, Ed Jenkins, who was the chairman of that committee, and later became chairman of the Fed's committee. And that report said, we need to think about business information in a much broader set. We need to look at financial reports, and we need to look at a whole bunch of other data. And we have gotten virtually no traction in that here in the United States. But as we become interconnected globally, the rest of the world has picked up on that in a slightly different context. And is actually exploiting that thought process in a new way of looking at business information. And in the United States, in the United States, we're somewhat hindered by our regulatory processes, our litigious environment, our desire from a competitive business environment to keep things secret, and other markets are expanding and looking at different activities from there. And so as an example, in that 1995 report, and Jim and I quoted this a few times during the Enron days, there was actually a recommendation that what we should look at as a business, at businesses, is not only what was in their financial business, but was also what was in something called special purpose enterprises, or entities. And the downfall of Enron was the abuse of special purpose entities. So here, we in 1995 had said we need to look at a broader footprint, and we had a regulatory model that actually prevented that from happening in the United States. Today, what's happening is that people are looking at business in a much different context. So in South Africa, and I like to use this example because I had an opportunity to spend several hours with the CEO of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, who is really on the forefront of what I'm going to describe to you. And South Africa is on the forefront of this. In South Africa, they say, if you're gonna access our capital markets, if you're gonna be listed as a public company in South Africa, you not only need to provide what we in the accounting world would describe as financial statements, but you need to provide two other things. One is you need to provide an assessment from management of that company about the viability of that company. Not so much in the technical accounting sense of a going concern that you may have studied or know about, but more about how does it operate and how does it achieve its strategic mission to stay in business. So let's say you're a manufacturing company and your supply chain goes through the Middle East. What are the implications of political unrest in the Middle East to your business life? Or let's say you're a manufacturer and you happen to sell significantly into Italy, and Italy's having an economic downturn, or Spain, or any place in Europe, pretty much. What is the economic implications to you from that standpoint? And they look to management to assert that. And they look to CPAs to somewhat, to some degree, attest to that. And then the third leg of that is something that is also happening a little bit in the U.S., but is not happening as much in the U.S. as it is in Asia and South Africa and other ways, is a sustainability report. We live in a world, we have a generation of people who have expected and do expect businesses to act in certain social ways. And what they expect is to have an information flow related to those social ways about how a company impacts planet Earth, their environmental assessment. Are they net contributors or are they not net contributors? Are they net users and how are they net users? And if they are net users, what is their ability to continue to access that resource 
for their going concern. So if I'm a manufacturing process that uses a lot of fresh water, a lot of futures would tell us that fresh water will be the, the number one scarce resource over the next 25 to 30 years. If I'm in a manufacturing process that uses a lot of fresh water, how am I going to have access to that? And so the sustainability, the implications to planet Earth, if you will, is included in a report that's also attested to in most cases by the CPA firm. And so these are opportunities for the profession to play a much broader and I would say a more decision useful way that information is going to expand. And so that is clearly on the line. Now at the same time, if you remember, I said three things. The traditional financial statement, the going concern of management's assertion of sustainability. So let's go back to that traditional financial statement. In the United States, there are two major trends that are happening in this space as well. A debate about whether or not we should use international financial reporting standards, for example. And a debate about whether or not we should have differential standards for private companies. And both of those are very near and dear to the ICPA's part, if you will. We firmly believe that for America, long term, to stay competitive in the global economic marketplace, that we should find a way for our companies in the U.S., public companies in the U.S., and obviously for the profession to, to use international accounting standards. Now, a lot of people are fighting that in the United States, politically fighting that, because they approach it from a standpoint which is, which is a little ego-driven, that says, well, by golly, the United States standards are the best, and why would we want to use those international standards and, in effect, lower our standards in doing so? We don't believe that that's the case. And we believe that for decades we have been saying to the rest of the world, elevate the veracity of your capital markets to be more like ours. And people have done that around the world. Not every place in the world, but around the world in many places. And so as the rest of the world is caught up, we have an obligation as Americans to also play in a similar spot. And so we believe that the adoption of international financial reporting standards, IFRS, is important for public companies. And as a way of getting there, because there's a lot of political pressure to not get there, as a way of getting there, we believe that one way to do that is to allow U.S. companies the option. Just like foreign companies can list in America using IFRS, why can't American companies have the option to use that as a way of sort of testing the market response, et cetera, in that environment? We don't think a lot of companies would, but maybe a dozen or so big companies might, and that would create an environment in the U.S. of change. And while we are as Americans, and predominantly as a political process in Washington, fighting this particular environment, we are also losing our influence in the international stage of these international standards. Because you see, in the construct of the International Accounting Standards Board, and Sir David Tweedy was here last year, and I'm sure talked about this, there are five American seats, which would include Canada, on the IASB, about an 18 person board. And the rest of the world is sort of sitting around saying, could you please explain to me again why it is that the Americans get to sit around the table and write the standards that I have to comply with, but the Americans don't? And if you were running the ISB, you might have some difficulty explaining that particular outcome. And so we sit in a sort of a preferred spot. We, have, we write our own standards. And we get to influence the rest of the world's standards to a, to a pretty significant portion. And the rest of the world's pushing back on that. And one of the things that has changed and just recently in the last 30 days or so is that the ISB, the International County Standards Board, has said, guess what? We have been sitting around the table with FASB, the U.S. Standard Center, for the last five years or so on a one-to-one -one relationship. So not only did we have five people on the board, but we also had that standards board and our standards board sitting around all these issues. And they said, no more. We're going to change that, and FASB is going to sit around a table that actually has 12 seats around it. And you're going to be one of 12 from an influence perspective, not one of one. Now, they did that, and they're not kicking off the Americans off of the International Standards Board, because they know that if they would do that, there would be no way politically we would ultimately get there. And so they're trying to juggle two political imperatives and trying to achieve that outcome. I would say that we are still a long ways in the U.S. from adopting IFRS. If I was here five years ago or 
right, or even seven or eight years ago, I would have said we would have been there by now. I was wrong because the political process, and to some degree the recession, caused that sort of political pushback to occur, and it's not likely to happen. It's not likely to happen in this four-year period of time with this administration. Then what about private companies? For more than 30 years, we've had this debate about private companies inside of our profession. And basically, the debate goes like this. There are people in our profession who believe that there should be different answers or different approaches for private companies. And the reason for that is they believe that it's important to create a more relevant set of information for private companies and the needs of users are different than the needs of users for, let's say, Cisco or Apple or Microsoft or GE. The need for the users of a private company set of financial statements is primarily the bank, depending on their industry, maybe the surety, and probably the entrepreneur him or herself. That's much different than a GE with hundreds of thousands of shareholders all over the world with no connectivity to that particular business. And so therefore, the hurdle of what is in that information set is different. Now, the other side of the argument is by people who do not believe we all have differences. And both groups are well-meaning, intelligent, passionate people who want to do the right thing. But their perspective is, well, you know, revenue is revenue. An asset is an asset. Liability is a liability. And we shouldn't have a different answer just because you're owned by two people or ten people instead of owned by hundreds of thousands in the public capital. And I would say those individuals lose sight of the relevancy question of the information set that's being produced. And so for the past several years, actually for the past 30 plus years, but with a new intensity in the past several years, we have been advocates for, again, my good friend Jim was a, sort of a catalyst in this area, being on a, chairing a special committee that we sort of started this renewed debate on. We have been strong advocates for creating an environment for private companies, those six to eight million private companies that produce financial statements for a different answer, a more relevant answer, a more stable answer in that particular environment. And it, as it has been for the past 30 plus years, in the last three to four years, it's been difficult to get sort of the establishment to address that particular point as well. And there were some models that we were in favor of, and, and there was a, was a particular report uh, that went out that said we should structure a certain way to set these standards that was rejected. And in the end, we ended up with a compromised position. And that compromised position creates an entity or a subgroup of FASB that will write private company accounting standards. It's called GAP. And in addition to that, the AICPA is writing a framework for financial reporting for small businesses. That's not generally accepted accounting principles, but under our technical terminology, another comprehensive basis of accounting. And that framework, which has been out of exposure, it will be adopted in June, will be rolled out to the marketplace, predominantly for smaller private businesses, to give CPAs and those businesses, and those CPAs who work for those businesses internally to the extent that they do, a framework that will allow them to produce financial information and it for it to be audited, reviewed, or compiled, depending on what the, the need is from that standpoint, to present to bankers and others uh, in a, what we believe in a more relevant way for people to make decisions as it relates to a small entrepreneur business as opposed to what's needed to make decisions as it relates to GE or Microsoft or Apple. And so that will be rolled out and that's going to be a very significant change. Uh, potentially the market will decide, but a very significant change uh, in the evolution of that particular notion. Now, let me shift a little bit into uh, Washington and to taxes a little bit as well. And what I'd like to spend a few minutes on in Washington is first, as accountants, CPAs, we believe we have some obligation to be engaged in the sort of the debate related to the financial health or ill health of the United States as well. And so, uh, I'd like to share with you a few moments of thought on that and some of the things that we're doing, and then talk to you about tax reform just for a few moments. First, financial health. Whether you 
look at our debate as far as our health, our, our financial health, from a Republican perspective or a Democratic perspective, there's a few things you have to agree to. First off, there's some awfully big numbers involved. When you start talking about trillions, it's big numbers, okay? And we sort of throw around trillions like they're $10 bills, and they aren't $10 bills. They're huge numbers. Secondly, we have some encumbrances that some way, somehow, whether you think, as some in Washington do, it'll just all work out over time, or whether you think we have to have an intervention into our process to get it, we have some encumbrances that have to be worked through one way or the other. So we are involved in three different initiatives as it relates to this issue. One is, a, is not our initiative, but we have signed on to it. It's called Fix the Debt. It is a truly bipartisan group. This group is led by a bunch of business leaders, a bunch of political leaders, not involved in politics directly, but former political leaders, who really have a message to Congress, look, we know some of you went to Congress and said, I will never vote for anything that might ever raise taxes. And we know some of you went to Congress and said, I will never vote for anything that might cut entitlements or might cut spending. The fact of the matter is, you both need to change your position to some degree. You both need to find a solution because we have to fix the debt. And that's basically their message. And so we support their initiative because it's very important for us. The second thing is we believe we have a role in educating Congress about things other than a cash basis budget. When we, if you go to uh, a state or local government in this country, we have everything is primarily uh, debated on the basis of accrual basis financial reports. We look at encumbrances and things of that nature. There's some changes happening in state and local government to even make it more emphatic about reflecting the total accountability. Uh, but when we look at the federal government, everything we talk about is on a cash basis. We build an aircraft carrier, we expense it. That's part of our cash expense this, this year. Uh, we get revenues in, we, we spend on anything, it's all current cash basis, and we talk about it in the context of where well, we've moved from 14 trillion to 17 trillion in the last 14 or 15 months as it relates to our deficit. And we've created a, a tool for the members of Congress, and essentially the message is this, it's called What's at Stake? We've said to them, look, you are like the board of directors of the company, the United States of America. And you have rules and expectations for people who serve on boards of directors who operate in the United States. You have expectations that those board members understand the financial well-being of that company and you make and expect them to make good decisions in that process. And in fact, you have laws that say if they don't, you're going to put them in jail. Or are you they going to get sued and lose every penny that they have? You have an obligation to look at the United States that way. And to do so, the first thing you ought to do is look at the audited financial statements of the United States. And here, ladies and gentlemen of Congress, what you will find, we've produced every member of Congress and every staff member on the Hill, which is a lot, have received a DVD from us with this. And you can access this videotape. It's 10 minutes long. It's on our website. It's free to the public. It's called What's at Stake. And basically it says, let's let us educate you a little bit about what the audit of financial statements of the federal government might say. The first thing is, get out of your mind, these are 2011 numbers, we're getting ready to update for 2012, so I'm going to use 2011 numbers. Get out of your mind that we have a $14 trillion deficit. Because you see in the audit of financial statement, there's all these footnotes over here with a lot of words in them. And if you read them, and you take those off-balance sheet accounts that you now said companies like Enron and, and others shouldn't have had off-balance sheet accounts. If you take those off-balance sheet accounts and put them on the balance sheet, it's not 14 trillion. It's 61 trillion. 61 trillion dollars. And oh, by the way, members of Congress, if you add up the net worth of every citizen in the United States, that's 56 trillion. So it's a little bit of a problem that you need to address from that standpoint. And however you want to address it, address it, but continuing it is a problem. Now, the actual numbers for 2012 will be even higher than what I just described to you. And really what we're trying to say is that we have to look holistically at our financial situation, and they should have the obligation just like we have the obligation as business leaders. 
The third thing we're involved with is we all know that government um, has a degree of inefficiency in it. We all know that. I mean, it's just intuitive in all of our DNA that we know that particular element. And uh, what we've said to, to, to government is, look, the debate about entitlements is a very emotional and political debate. Let's put that on the side. You figure that out. You got to figure it out, but you figure it out. But what about the operating efficiency of government? What about the redundancies? What about the antiquated computer technologies? What about everything that's inefficient? The billions of dollars of unoccupied real estate and you rent a building next door to it for some other agency. What about that? And we have said to government, look, the problem you have as government is that you can't ever vote to do away with any of those inefficiencies and redundancies because it's always political. And so let's look at what in history we've done about that. And the only example we have in modern history where Congress has actually voted to do away with this is something called the Base Closing Commission. And for those of you who follow that, Congress was going through, you know, America was going through a downsizing of our military. And as part of that, you had to close some bases. Well, no congressman ever wanted to vote for a closing of a base in their district or in their state. Political suicide. So they could never vote to close any bases. They just kept them all going. And so Congress enacted a law to set up a commission of wise men and women who would then recommend what bases to be closed, and Congress, by action of the law, agreed to either vote en masse, up or down on that recommendation. And every recommendation that has gone to Congress, they voted for. And we've closed bases. And so we've said to, to Congress, we need a government transformation approach. And so we are, we are working to try to get Congress to pass a law to set up a commission of wise men and women in which there is a set consulting and evaluation process on the efficiency of government that would come to this commission and they would decide which ones would be handed to Congress. And again, taking entitlements off the table. And then Congress, by action of the law, would agree to either go up or down on these packages that would come along to try to take the politics out of that environment. And the fact of the matter is, is that we have huge inefficiencies. We have seven different agencies that handle education programs, education credit programs. We have an agency called the Rural Electrification Administration. The Rural Electrification Administration was formed in the Great Depression for purposes of making sure that we had electricity in every corner of the country. We have electricity in every corner of the country. We don't necessarily probably need a Rural Electrification Administration. And you can go answer, you can get examples and examples and examples. And so we have said we would commit to try with two other partners, uh, coalition, to uh, get Congress to enact this process. And that is different than, say, some of you might have heard Simpson Bowles, which is, this is how to fix the budget. That's a presidential commission. It has no standing. It's a presidential commission. The president, which he has, can ignore it. The Congress, which they have, can ignore it. And nothing ever gets done with that commission. This process would mandate a vote of Congress which is a different way of approaching, trying to give them political cover in a way to make the hard decisions from that standpoint. So, fix the debt, the uh, government transformation initiative and what's at stake are all things that we're doing with that. Now I'd like to close and then we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, a little bit about the evolution of some things that need to change in the profession going forward. One of those is in the education area. And we're on an education institution, a great education institution. But education in general in this country is under serious, serious challenges. And this is a private university. Um, it has a different set of challenges than state-based state or, or government-funded universities. Change management in universities is a very difficult process, right, Dean? <laughs> yeah, we'll, yes, with that. Um, it's relatively slow. Most universities lack resources to incentivize change, like corporate America would. Um, yet, we have these huge technological implications that are going on in changing the way education is delivered and the expectation of the new generation of these uh, uh, education uh, environments. Why is that important to us? Because in the United States, unlike in many other places in the world, our profession is based on a model in which accountants are supplied through a university system. 
So we're pretty interested in this. It's the lifeblood of our profession. Well, the fact is, is that it is, I would say, this is my opinion, this isn't a statement of the AICPA, I would say that it is highly unlikely that a 10-year-old today is going to go to a university that looks anything like and operates anything like the universities are today. Uh, mass online capabilities are going to change dramatically how people are educated. And with that, the debate becomes, how, does you, how do universities go through their change management? What are the implications to accounting in that particular environment? And maybe more importantly, how do we change the accounting environment as well? Because as I talked about transformation type of issues and IFRS and cloud computing and big data and new approaches to technology and integrated reporting, I would dare say we could probably go into most classrooms around the world, around the country, and not find those topics being front and center in a lot of classrooms. And that becomes an issue as it relates to the connectivity of education, to the real world output where people are hired in those particular environments. We undertook a study of this jointly with AAA. AAA is the organization that academics, uh, accounting PhDs are in. Uh, so it's a joint project of AICPA and AAA, and it, and it was to look at the future of accounting education. It has seven different recommendations in it. The seventh, is actually an implementation recommendation. So it's not a fundamental recommendation, but it says on the basis of these other six, this is, we actually want to implement them, and so here's a recommendation how we implement them. Essentially, the six uh, talk about the evolution of what we teach in classrooms, the ped what's called the pedagogy, or, or what, what a, uh, an academic actually teaches in the classroom, uh, how people become PhDs, what they research in order to get credit for that PhD, the interaction of the profession with the academic community, and the emphasis on practical outcomes from that standpoint. And that's why I referenced your research, because it was very practical. So too often, the research that people perform in order to become PhDs is very esoteric in our profession. And therefore, most practitioners except those in very highly technical and specialized industries or positions, don't find that research practical in changing their world. And when research in the academic world isn't sort of connected to what needs to change in a person's real world, people don't pay enough attention to that academic world. And so it, it, recommends, it recommends changing the accreditation standards, which are likely to be voted on in the next uh, month or so. It recommends uh, giving credit for more practical research. It recommends that state organizations like the Missouri Society find ways to connect the academic community and the profession much more directly, sort of like today is, but even in a more emphatic way, the technical and competency issues. You see, if we were in a law school, it would be very common for professors in the law school and practitioners in law to be there. If we were in a medical school, it would be very common for teaching physicians to be sitting next to and presenting to practicing physicians. We don't do that in our profession very much. And so we have to find ways to embrace that more, which will elevate and improve the education world, but will also ensure that the output and the activities of the education world is more closely aligned with what people do in the real world from the standpoint of the And we also, as a profession, have to step up in some ways. So we have a shortage of PhDs accruing in this country. We funded the creation of, of uh, about 120 new PhDs in accounting over the last four years. It'll take three more years for them to all get through the pipeline. And the requirement was every one of them, every, we raised $17 million to do this, every one of them had to have practical experience before they actually got in the PhD program. And every PhD program they were put in and our money went to support, had to be one in which they actually got through the PhD program in four years, not some of the PhD programs that involved the five and six years of getting them through it. And they had to be committed to an emphasis on teaching and being in the classroom, as opposed to moving their sort of career to just being a research. And, and some research universities, some teachers teach partly at all. They're just in um, an academic research environment. And so we have the, the first class of those 30, or the first 30 of the 120 that's getting ready to enter the workforce. And, and so we're going to look at sort of the interaction pathways to that particular environment as well. So in closing, uh, the CPA profession 
the implications of the CPA profession are very, very, very dramatic to our economic well-being. This is, there are a lot of contributors to why our economy historically has been the best in the world, the most transparent, the most efficient. Um, and one of those contributing factors is our profession. You see, every one of those six or eight or nine or 23 or 25 million businesses, depending on how you want to define it, almost every one is a CPA relationship. And every public company has this sort of connectivity with the audit function that ensures transparency and efficiency in our capital market system. So the two halves of our system are very much related to the role of the CPA profession. And our profession, unlike maybe some stereotypes, embraces change embraces technology, and embraces a new frontier in what our profession will all will be about. And with that, we believe that our profession will continue to play an absolutely essential role in the financial and economic well-being, not only of this country, but globally on an international basis as well. Thank you very much for your attention. So a few questions. Yep. Former accountant who left the profession 30 years or so ago. Shame on you. So I'm sorry if the second question seems a little intuitively obvious to you. First question, though, has to do with your South African example. Does that imply that the firms that operate in that kind of a reporting operation also hire professionals who are capable of issuing independent opinions about those topics? or? Is this a dot your I, cross your T? I'm looking at what the profession that the firm hired, the company okay. hired, and right. I'm simply auditing their work to say, yes, they did a thorough job. Yeah. Well, there's clearly a part of it that is other professions bring to the table. But so, for instance, some of the big accounting firms have actually hired engineering firms and environmental type of firms, and are, I should say, acquired. They're actually part of the umbrella of some of those firms in those particular environments. Clearly, it does take some different skill set, but if you think about if you think about what most of that is, part of it is clearly certain, particularly engineering sciences that are in, involved in some of this, measuring certain things. But what we talk about in a sustainability type of reporting environment, what it entails is measurement, recognition against certain standards, and ultimately, uh, creating an environment in which there is assurance or reliability about that information from a consistency perspective. Now those attributes that I just said are the absolute sweet spot of our profession, right? If you look at if you look at accounting information and you look at the world of big data and all the things that's changing, it's about looking at measurement and recognition against a set of standards and producing an outcome that is reliable. So it's the same thing from that standpoint, albeit potentially with some specific, specific skill sets in that. Second question, and again, I apologize for the 30 year lag. <laughs> is there an easy way for anybody else in the room who doesn't perhaps know the answer to this to describe what the major differences are between the IFRS and GAAP? Uh, well, first off, anytime you talk about accounting standards and use the word easy in that sentence, no. like this, uh, so let's just, let's just start with that statement. <laughs> Brief is a better word. Uh, there are, there are a lot of things that are out there that have summaries of it. Uh, actually, FASB on their website has produced some things that shows the differences. All of the uh, big firms you know, have some, you know, in the public domain of their websites have certain, uh, you know, summaries of that type of information. The gap has been narrowed in the U.S. versus international. I would say I can give you a brief answer on top of that. Uh, there are, um, uh, there, there are certain differences in, in valuation areas right now that's pretty critical. There are differences in inventory, there are, in, there are differences in business combinations, uh, and maybe the biggest difference is in certain industry specificity. So our system in the United States has a lot of granularity in certain special industries. Insurance is a prime example. And at the international level, there's very little, little specificity in these sort of verticals that exist, insurance again being the example. And so there would be a pretty different, a pretty big gap, not GAP, but GAP, in what sort of the notion of insurance accounting looks like in the US versus in the international. So it's kind of a difference in the, in the 
scaling or the, the nature of the rulers that are used? Uh, there, there's some technical differences, but but they are narrowing. Another example is 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 to, it, this is going to sound weird. How can you have a difference in depreciation? But on the IFRS, it's component part depreciation. In the U.S., it's it's not component part depreciation. So if you own an airplane in the in under IFRS. You would depreciate the engines, you would depreciate the fuselage, you would depreciate the seats. In the United States, you depreciate the airplane. Got it. Thanks. And that's about exhausted my knowledge of the technical aspects. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, President Valentine, thank you for coming to St. Louis and inviting us to come and hear you today. I thought it was appropriate when I received the program uh, to point out that a uh, bunch of us in the room here, I think, are probably from the earlier wave, maybe the, the 70s era, were creeping towards retirement. But I wanted to point out that uh, Dean Vasquez and Professor Wooler were pointed out as honorees in our lecture today. And uh, just personally, uh, Dean Vasquez was instrumental, I think, in steering. He personally interviewed a lot of us who attended business school here and was very instrumental in pushing a lot of us towards the accounting program. And uh, Dr. Wilder was a professor par excellence, and I think your demeanor this afternoon, your, your appearance here today is very mindful to us of Dr. Wilder. So, thank you for appearing. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, I've heard wonderful things about you. That, uh, from what I heard, that's a, that's a very nice compliment. I really appreciate it because uh, several people have commented about the influence of John had. That's okay. We, we still like you. He's not an accountant. I'm not an accountant, but I, I ask you this question just as an American. You know, whether the liabilities are 17 or whether they're 61, when I look at those things, it, it scares me. You know, I can't go to sleep at night when I think about this too seriously. So where does your group get the authority to be able to mandate the Congress and uh, what is the hope that you really can do some kind of a mandate when we can't even get Congress to agree upon a budget for, what has it been, four or five years? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, mandate's probably the wrong word. We don't have a mandate. We're, we're like any other group that has the ability to try to influence. We're pretty good at it. We, we, um, we have a, a pretty big operation in Washington. So as an example, the Dodd-Frank bill, we were the first people, we, we exempt, we got our profession exempted from judicial regulation, which is an incredibly burdensome piece of legislation. That was no small task. It was, it was a pretty significant legislative accomplishment in the negative as opposed to in the positive. Uh, we, we, so for instance, in the tax reform bait, and I really didn't talk much about tax reform. We have a lot of rhetoric about tax reform. You know, we have great relationships with the Ways and Means members and the Treasury, et cetera. We're providing them information, things to think about in that process. So we have a reputation from that standpoint. And I would say that the profession sort of reputation of independence and objectivity and integrity adds to that particular debate. The likelihood of that passing, look, it's not great. I'm not, that, we have said, look, we're not going to beat our head against the wall and fight for this for five years. We're giving Congress a, pa a, a package. We have made some traction with the, the chairman of the Government Affairs Committee in the House is supportive, he's a Republican. We have to be bipartisan. The ranking member, uh, Representative Cummings, in, in that same committee in the House is probably 75% there. That would be a huge issue. But the fact is, is that if it starts in the House, we're gonna have a problem because the Senate's gonna then have a difficulty. So we gotta get the Senate. Um, you know, we're working, the, the ranking member here, a Republican, and the, and the majority member, Democrat in the Senate, Coburn and, and Coker, to, to try to be supportive from that standpoint. It's probably less than a 50% chance. Well, I, I, I'm fully supportive, don't get me wrong. In fact, I wanted to ask you, is there anything we can do uh, in terms of writing our congressman, senator, uh, in order to get them to listen? Because you're, you're the greatest hope I've heard from the <laughs> <family>. <laughs> Please. <laughs> We're just trying. It's a very complicated process. And you're right, it's not the 17 and the 61, it's all those zeros that go behind. Right. It's the real process. Exactly. Right. Uh, there is some, it's called the Government Transformation Initiative, GTI. There's a website. It's, it's very low-key. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a good government group that's involved with it, that uh, we're involved with it, and the former Controller General of the United States, David Walker, who happens to be a CPA. That's the sort of the three. You can go on that website, and then you can write to your congressman and say, hey, I read about GTI. It's something that you really ought to support and discuss the move in the Congress. That would not hurt. Um, or your senator, or whoever you want to write to. Um, 
you know, it, it, it is going to be tough because if you're elected to Congress, what, are you, what is the primary reason why you go to Congress? You go to Congress to spend money, you know, a lot of people do. I'm not talking about irrational spend, but to appropriate money, right? To decide we're going to spend it on A versus B versus C. And that's a pretty significant uh, requirement. And to, you know, make sure that you think on the downside, if you're going to cut, that the things that you think are the right priorities or not the right priorities are the ones that cut. And so, in effect, we're saying to Congress, you can't do it. You know, give up your authority to some degree and let somebody else do it. Well, that's not really what people got elected to. But let me share with you a real quick story on this, because I think it's important to understand there is hope. Uh, we have today 10 CPAs in Congress, which is an all-time record. And they're bipartisan. There's seven Republicans and three Democrats. We have a CPA caucus co-chaired by a Republican and Democrat. All good. The youngest member of the United States Congress that was just elected, he's 29 years old, is a CPA. He's from Florida. He won a very tight hotly contested race. He's a Democrat. But he's a fiscal conservative and he's a social moderate. That's just what he is. And he has led a, a group of 36 freshman members of Congress, they're not all CPAs obviously, to, to, um, to create an environment of bipartisanship. And what they did, this is, this is pretty interesting, they, they, they issued a letter to the President, to the Speaker, to Nancy Pelosi, etc. And they said, look, we're not here to blame people. We're here to get to a solution. Let's get on with a, 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 the grand bargain. And they said, you know, when they were writing that letter, they said, we have to live by what we said. And what they did is they paired up and half Republicans and half Democrats. And at the State of the Union, half of the pairs of Republican and Democrat sat on the Republican side of the aisle. And the other half, Republican and Democrat, sat on the Democrat side of the aisle. So he paired up with another freshman with CPA in the Congress. They sat in the middle he sat with his Republican paired up CPA in the middle of tea, the Tea Party, okay, on the Republican side of the aisle, which took some guts. And so, as you know, when the President gives a State of the Union address, everybody stands up and gives a, you know, no, not everybody, the Democrats, in the case of a Democratic President, stand up and give a standing ovation every 32 seconds to whatever the President says. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he was constantly standing up. And he said, the first time I stood up, he's, he's really an interesting guy. He said, the first time I stood up, I realized there was this massive Tea Party members who totally disagreed with that agreement on the social issues. And all eyes were on me. He's like, who is this guy standing up? Because no one really knew who he was at that point. So this group of 35 or 36 freshman members of Congress, they sat across the aisle and they did something really different. And the rest of Congress has taken notice of that. So I share that with you only to say there is some hope. You know, there are a lot of problems, and the media drives a lot of these sort of goofy outcomes. But there is some hope, and so I'm pretty, pretty positive that somebody will find a way. And so we're just trying to help to it just a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Need all of that you can get. <laughs> One more. One more. One more. Yes. I have a question. I'm an Ash junior, and in our class, a lot of talk about IFRS. The two main issues that always come up are the education country, and as you're talking, the scope of things on insurance, baby insurance, and how they cover that, and there's more interpretation, right. as well as the teeth of right. the international board. They don't have any barrier to come down on education in particular if you look at that board of that country that comes down on them. How do you deal with that if you're pro IFRS? Okay, so I'm going to start with the last part. And just to repeat this, he said that the issues are, you know, the litigation environment in the U.S., the, the specific industry examples, and then the board doesn't have any teeth. So I would challenge, and if your professor's in the room, I would actually challenge your professor in the lab point, right? Because standard setting is set in an independent way. And even in the U.S., the FASB does not have any teeth to come down with, right? The teeth comes from the SEC for public companies saying, what FASB said, you company must comply with. And so the SEC, a federal, U.S. federal government agency, enforces that. And so what the SEC says to that same company, what, I, what the ISB has said, IFRS, you have to comply with, it's the exact same team. Okay, so that's, in my opinion, a non-issue. Now, a tremendous issue is our political and standard setting environment. And the way it's generally characterized is the issue of principles versus rules. Now, there is a degree of misnomer in this, and there's a degree of truth in this. First off, I was sitting in a meeting about four years ago with a standard setter from New York, 
and he was just chastising Americans because we had too many rules. And he, and he pulled out this card, and he said, you see, this card, front and back, is about the size of a business card. This is the principles in which we set, we set rules, and we can set accounting standards on the basis of this little card. I was like, give me a break, okay? That's what he said. And, and as you drill down, you realize there was 18,000 pages that they had somewhere in their system that supported that little card. So it was a little bit of a misnomer. But to be fair, if we put a spectrum, principles-based and rules-based, the U.S. system is not all rules-based. There are principles, there's a conceptual framework, etc. And the international system is not all principles-based. The reality is it's not all the way here, it's here. And the reality is it's not all the way here, it's here. And the fact of the matter is, for the U.S. to adopt it, this one is going to have to move more to here. Now, we're still going to have a gap. And that gap creates a problem for our profession. Because we have regulators in, in courts who aren't going to, or are going to second guess. They will second guess. And in the rest of the world, that doesn't really happen. And that's a risk point. And we have, we have been advocates for, you've got to find a way to create frameworks, judgment frameworks, that you're going to at least pay respect to. Right? Regulators, the SEC. They're not willing and they won't give a safe harbor. They won't say if you did thought about these six things, then we're not going to pay, take any impact. And that'll never happen. But there's got to be an attitude in the system that at least says, I'm not going to second guess everything you have to do. And if, if you don't have that attitude, we will not be able to implement it. That's, that's just, it's a great question and it is true. I think it is our hope that when you look at the efficacy of the international markets, the interconnectivity, the importance from a U.S. competitive environment, that we will actually help create an environment that will nudge it a little bit. And if we nudge it a little bit, the profession is probably willing to take some risk from us. Great question. Thank you all very much. Thank you on behalf of all of us. This was truly outstanding, and we really enjoyed it. We had a little thank you, my we thank you very much. Enjoy Thanks, David. Thank, thank you for coming. Let me just take one minute to thank a couple of people, three or four people, again briefly. <laughs> First, Jim Castellano. Again, he was instrumental in bringing Barry here. Jim, thank you. So much. mention uh, lots and lots of people on our staff who've been important in making this day and this uh, visit uh, work. Pat Galati, the Secretary in the Accounting Department, uh, Linda Paglish, Graham Smith, Brett uh, Delario, etc., and, and other staff as well. I know I'm going to leave something out, okay? But they've all worked hard, and uh, I think it's, it's paid off and you can see it. We appreciate you all being here. We have a reception, so please join us for a bit. Thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you.